Dr. Lam, President Teng, um, Professor Chen, distinguished speakers, honorable uh, guests, and ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Wow, what an honor. I feel both privileged and humbled to stand here. I actually didn't expect this because I've been to many, many uh, meetings, conferences, and I have given several dozens of keynote speeches, but none of them is like this. Uh, I feel uh, really humbled and honored. Thank you so much for inviting me to be uh, uh, the plenary speaker for the uh, first session. And let me uh, express my sincere gratitude to the organizing committee, not only to Paul Yu, of course, but to the staff for uh, organizing such a wonderful meeting. And I hope my talk will not disappoint you. But although the title of my talk is to target sodium channels for pain relief, but after realizing that this is about interdisciplinary research, I reorganized my slide and you will see how we benefited from interdisciplinary collaboration. And actually the talk is about electricity. What's this? It's electric eel, right? So we cannot, I mean, most people here cannot imagine a life without electricity. But electricity is not only important in human society. It is also important in almost, not almost, actually in all multicellular animals because many um, electric, many physiological, essential physiological processes such as heart beating, contraction, muscle contraction, and neuro, uh, and transduction of neural signals rely on electric si signals. Um, I always give this example. So if you touch a hot plate, a hot surface, you can immediately withdraw your finger, right? To avoid uh, the harm. So how can you detect this high temperature and immediately react? That's because electric signals can uh, travel along our axons at a speed of up to 100 to 100, 120 meters per second. That's really fast. That's how we, res we respond to uh, long distance signals uh, with a very fast velocity of big, well, but uh, how is electric signals conducted? This was actually the cornerstone of modern biophysics. In 1945, Hodgkin and Huxley discovered um, the so-called action potential. Shown here is a highly simplified version of action potential. So basically in our bodies, in the so-called excitable cells, such as neurons and the muscles, the cell membrane is polarized in that the asymmetric distribution of sodium and potassium ions establish an electric field. You understand that engineers here, right? The electric field across membrane is known as the membrane potential. But this is not an electric, uh, static electric field. It's highly dynamic. It fluctuates. And it is negative inside of the cell. So when it rises, we call it depolarization of the membrane potential. Uh, when um, the membrane potential uh, depolarizes to certain threshold, one important class of channels known as the voltage-gated sodium channels activate. I will call them NAV channels. Um, the activation of such channels meaning, uh, means that the central pore opens to allow for the rapid influx of sodium ions from the envir environment into the cell. Sodium ions carry positive charges that leads to the increase for the increase of the membrane uh, potential or for the depolarization then sodium channels immediately inactivate that means they close their central pore and meanwhile potassium channels activate um, as the name indicates potassium channels mediate the influx of potassium ions from the cell to the environment leading to the reset of the membrane potential back to the negative uh, uh, side so this is a highly simplified one. And in our body, in every uh, in everyone, we have nine subclasses of sodium channels. Their primary role is to initiate and propagate action potentials, but they distribute, as you can see here, tissue specificity. Because of their fundamental physiological significance, uh, mutations or misregulations of these genes lead to various disorders depending on their tissue, tissue distribution. For example, NAV1.5 is the one that, uh, uh, that uh, controls our heartbeat. Basically, they are the pacemakers. So mutations in NAV1.1, there are more than 400 mutations. Um, these mutations are associated with like uh, the arrhythmia or sudden death. Um, 
on the other hand, the family of um, NAV 1.7, 1.8, and 1.9 are distributed on the so-called dorsal root ganglia. This family, uh, these subtypes have drawn increasing attention from pharmaceutical companies. Why is that? It's associated actually with a sort of national crisis in the United States known as the opiate crisis. Why is that? Because you know, in adults in the United States every day, uh, like chronic pain is uh, represents an unmet healthcare need. And in China, I was reading that more than 30% of adults suffer from uh, chronic pain. So there are different sort of painkillers, but most of them have the side effect of addiction. So in the United, in China, you know, most of the drugs are under control, but in the United States or some European countries, the misuse or overdosing of opiates have uh, caused significant uh, economic and uh, social problem. So shown here is a summary before the pandemic. Before the pandemic, actually, if you read the newspaper, um, the this opiate crisis has frequently made headlines. So there has been an urgent need for um, novel and un uh, uh, non-addictive uh, painkillers. Then why are we care? Why uh, are we interested in NAV 1.7? Whoops, so happy. Uh oh, sorry, there's a swap on my slide. So this can be traced back to almost 20 years ago. In 2008, uh, there was a report in Nature uh, identifying the gene known as SN9A. So what does this gene encode? It encodes NAV 1.7. It's, it's, so a group of genetics from United Kingdom uh, discovered that a, a very famous boy in Pakistan known as the Pakistani boy who could not feel pain at all. But when they tried to study the genetic basis for that, this boy unfortunately already died. Why is that? Because he could not feel pain. He could not, he could not avoid danger. So pain is actually a, a mechanism for us to protect ourselves. So they sequenced um, the genomes of his cousins who happened to have the same uh, like pain uh, indifference and identified nonsense mutation. That means like the gene expression was terminated in the middle, okay? Early termination of this gene. Uh, it is SA9, which uh, encodes NAV 1.7. So basically loss of function of this gene, gene uh, SA9A leads to insensitivity to pain. And two years ago, in retrospect, in 2004, three groups independently reported the discovery of mutations in the same gene SA9A that can uh, lead to super sensitivity to pain. Even a gentle touch can cause pain disorder. So that's why uh, pharmaceutical companies are, are, are extremely interested in this channel, um, NAV 1.7, because block, blocking this channel can pretend, I mean, can represent a potential strategy to relieve pain. However, however when we try to inhibit um, I, sorry, I always try to use uh, you know, the laser pointer. Anyway, uh, when we try to block this specific channel, we have to make sure that the other channels which share high degree of, same, uh, of sequence similarity with uh, NAV 1.7 not to be inhibited, especially NAV 1.5, right? You do not want to stop heart beating when you try to uh, eliminate pain. That's why structures are uh, required. When I started my lab in Tsinghua in 2007, I had this ambition to solve all the structures of uh, human sodium channels so that uh, we can identify potential subtype specific druggable sites. So this is very confusing. Basically, we want to uh, identify NAV 1.7 specific sites that can be blocked, but not, uh, that, but you know, this site is not present in other subtypes. This is called the subtype specific inhibitors. Um, so sodium channels belong to a superfamily known as VGS the voltage gated ion channels. Um, so apart from sodium channels, calcium channels and also uh, uh, potassium channels also belong to them. So this, this family name is uh, given based on the sequence similarity. Not all the channels uh, have this uh, membrane potential sensitivity, but we do have two fundamental questions to address. First, uh, what determines the ion specificity? Why some channels can only permeate sodium ions, but not the calcium or potassium, uh, vice versa? And more intriguingly, how can they detect 
uh, or monitor the subtle fluctuations of membrane potential to open or close their central gate. So this is called uh, the gating mechanism. So our, uh, like from the perspective of basic research, we try to identify the molecular basis for ion selectivity and uh, voltage uh, dependent gating mechanism. Even before, before the structure was available, um, sequence analysis has shown that all uh, VGIC members, voltage gated on channel members, share similar, similar architecture of a fourfold symmetry or pseudo symmetry. And each, uh, each repeat has six transmembrane helices uh, known as S1 to S6. And among this, S4 is pretty unique in that it carries repetitively occurring um, residues. Like uh, we call them basic residues. So they are positively charged, all right? And on the breakthrough was made by Professor Ron McKinnon in uh, Rockford University who solved the first structure of a potassium channel. Shown here is only um, half of the channel from the side view. Uh, <laughs> without pointing, it's difficult. But on the top, you can, you see, you can see the four spheres. They re represent potassium ions, all right? But this is only half of the channel. And it does not contain um, S1 to S4. So that's a bacterial homologue. But this structure win him the Nobel Prize in chemistry in 2003. And then a few years later, uh, the McKinnon lab determined the crystal structure of a voltage gated potassium channel, which gave us the first uh, glimpse of um, you know, the VGIC member. As you can see in the center is the so-called pore domain that is responsible for the uh, uh, se selective ion permeation. And surrounding the central pore are four independent voltage sensors. Um, each one contains S1 to S4, all right? So this is the top view. So that's a um, kind of like a general introduction. You may ask, oh, the crystal structure is available. Why are you still working on that? Actually, this is for potassium channel. It is a hormone tetramer. And what we are interested in is sodium and calcium channels that contains four different repeats. But we already, although at that time, we already understand the principles for designing a voltage-gated ion channel. That is, you have to have a uh, molecular sieve to uh, discriminate different ions. You have to have a central gate to open or close um, you know, the ion conducting channel. And you have to have a voltage sensor that can monitor the change of the membrane potential and translate that uh, electric signal to the opening or closure of the gate. So this mechanism is known as the uh, electromechanical coupling. All right, so probably, you know, for those uh, from the engineering background, you can understand electromechanical coupling, right? That's already a device. You know, this is not, the protein is not static. It's not just, for, it's not just a source of nutrient. It is a machine, a mini machine. So uh, as I explained, although we have this general perception of the channels, we know the structure, the detailed structure of potassium channels, but for sodium and calcium channels, the single chain pseudo symmetry made them extremely challenging target for structural analysis. I will not explain the, uh, the detail. And on the other hand, apart from uh, you know, the different um, tissue distribution, the nine subtypes of sodium channels also have distinct biophysical uh, properties such as different thresholds. I mean, they, different sodium channels can detect uh, different uh, membrane potential thresholds, okay? And they have you know, distinct inactivation uh, uh, kinetics, which I will explain later. All right, uh, so I explained that we try to solve the structures to identify drug both sites that are specific to 9.7. But on the other hand, there are also common questions for all sodium channels to be addressed. First, how to, uh, you know, uh, how the four repeats are arranged remain unclear. Like, because they have like four repeats connected on the single chain. So theoretically, there are like at least six ways to arrange these four repeats. And before the structure was available, this remained an open question. It's very simple, but unknown. And on the other hand, uh, four different amino acids, DEKA, this, I know these are very weird codes <laughs> for you guys, but DEKA represent four different amino acids that together define the sodium selectivity, but we had no idea how they work, how they coordinate uh, to get, conduct sodium, but not calcium or potassium. And the four repeats do not activate uh, simultaneously. So the first three repeats actually activate faster than the fourth one. Well, when I use faster, that means they are 
like about one millisecond faster than the fourth one. And the activation of the fourth repeat actually leads to another process known as inactivation. That means the gate immediately closed. How is that achieved? Previous work uh, back in 1970 uh, by professors uh, Armstrong and uh, Bodinia actually identified some cytosolic segments that are responsible that is responsible for fast inactivation. And then in 1992, Professor uh, Bill Cattrall from University of Washington identified a cluster that can consist of IFN motif, I mean, three amino acids known as IFN motif that is responsible for the fast inactivation. So a ball and a chain model was uh, proposed to account for, um, you know, this so-called so fast inactivation that can occur within one millisecond, all right? So, however, in the following uh, two decades, this model, uh, began to be challenged. Why? Because some of the mutational data do not uh, support this simple ball and the chain model. So exactly how are sodium channels inactivated also remains to be uh, unveiled. Last but not least, I'm talking about the pain relief. And you know, sometimes a uh, bite by a skull, uh, a skull pin and like, I was thinking most of them give you the, the pain, but give you the pain, but not eliminate the pain, right? But sodium channels actually represent the primary target for the animal uh, toxins from the nature or um, uh, the local anesthetics and many other FDA approved drugs. So seven sites have been uh, mapped to the primary sequence of sodium channels, but none of them could be modeled uh, based on the homotetrameric potassium channels. That's why we need to uh, reveal the high resolution three-dimensional structures to understand how these uh, toxins from nature, from animals or even from plants act on these channels. And when I started this, I was like a junior PI. I was ambitious, but I didn't realize how difficult that was. And then one year after I told my students that, oh, this to solve the structure of sodium channels would be my lifetime project because it is so difficult, but do not, <laughs> As a young one, you, you you should not use lifetime because you know the technological uh, uh, advances can be much faster than you expected. So in 2013, as a structural biologist, I was amazed by the rapid progress in the technical advances in a new technology, uh, not new, an old, very old technology known as electron microscopy. So we experienced the so-called resolution revolution. So basically, Carl Yam previously could only reveal the structure, I mean, uh, three dimensional structure to a resolution of about one nanometer. Okay, that was already the upper limit. But then with the uh, uh, combination of advanced uh, technology in electron um, detection, as well as the advancement in the computing power, all right? Some new algorithms were developed by, uh, by physicists and also um, uh, computer scientists, we were able to push the resolution to 0.1 nanometer, which we call as, we define as MSTRA, all right? So now the resolution limit for cryem already uh, breaks the one angstrom limit. So it is very powerful because the good thing is you do not need to crystallize this protein. So that means you only need a little bit of sample and these samples do not have to be homogeneous. Um, to cut the long story short, so because of the fantastic state-of-the-art EM facility built up by uh, Professor Yi Gongxi, who is now the president of Westlake University, we were able to quickly solve the structures of a few calcium channels, which are cousins of sodium channels. Why did we start with calcium channels? Because they are bigger. For EM, it's the bigger, the easier, all right? And with the success, we were we gained confidence and we eventually we were able to solve the first structure of a eukaryotic sodium channel as shown on the uh, upper left. And then in the uh, ensuing years, we were able to solve the structures of various sodium ch channels. Eventually, we solved almost all, uh, I mean, the structures of almost all human sodium channels except NAV 1.9 and NAV 1.3. Uh, uh, but from these structures, we have learned a great deal. So we are very close to our uh, original goal, that is to solve all the structures of human uh, sodium channels. So shown here are the first two structures solved by Kral Yam uh, by us. 
And well, to be honest, we were pretty disappointed because if you remember, I introduced to you these channels are machines, right? They need to undergo uh, like cons uh, continue, I mean, uh, conformational motions. I'm not sure whether you can understand conformation. So this is one conformation. This is another conformation and the change I mean, the motion is achieved through changes uh, of conformations, all right? So it's the same to the protein. We need to get the structures of different conformations to understand their working cycle. However, when we solve the structures, we only obtain two different conformations. All the human channels share nearly identical structures as the one from electric eel. So we were very disappointed, but uh, you, uh, <laughs> oops. Okay, in 2021, everyone talking about alpha fold, right? So we're very happy. We're like, oh, now we can have a great tool that may help us uh, obtain more confirmations. Then we checked, um, you know, the database uh, that can give you all the predicted structures. To our disappointment, all the structures remain almost identical to our deposited ones. And in retrospect, we were silly because you know these models were trained based on the models we deposited. Of course, they cannot give us new models because they have no such knowledge to give you a new confirmation, right? So even now, uh, we could not find any new confirmation from the database. So that's why uh, I always say like, uh, AI at this moment is still disappointing in that AlphaFold 2 only reached what we have achieved in 2017. Well, even so, even just from two confirmations, we were able to uh, extract a lot of information to understand the working mechanism and the pathogenic mechanism of these channels. Um, if you remember, I have three fundamental, fundamental questions. First, the selectivity, uh, ion selectivity. So uh, briefly, uh, you know, the high resolution maps can reveal where the ion is bound. Uh, you know, the, the magenta mesh represents like the uh, ions bound to the selective, selectivity filter. And for sodium channels, as you can see here, D, E, K, A, they look like this. Uh, I will not go to details to describe the structure, basically combined, combined with molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, that is a way to predict uh, the, uh, you know, new, kind of the, the dynamics of uh, a static structure, we were able to identify the binding site for sodium. And based on the calculation, we understand why this channel, this molecular sieve does not prefer potassium because potassium prefers a different chemical group, all right? But at this moment, we, still, we cannot explain why it prefers sodium over calcium. So that's something ongoing. So if uh, there are chemists here, uh, so one challenge in MD simulation is that the fo force field is not ideal because the force field for MD simulation is based on classical mechanics, but we, we need uh, quantum mechanics to understand ion coordination. And the second question is gating, right? How the gate is opened or closed in response to the change of the membrane potential. So the two different structures gave us different conformations and Interestingly, they do have different diameters in the intracellular gate. Uh, if you see some like uh, broader uh, length, that means the gate is, is kind of loose. And this represents a um, tightly sealed gate. So this is not MD simulation. Based on the two static images, we were able to create a morph uh, to show how to, to, to mimic how uh, the gate uh, opens. As you can see here, they actually undergo a very elegant iris like rotation. Whoops. So the four, we call that a helical bundle. And you can see accompanying the helical, the iris like uh, rotation of the hydrohelical bundle, we can see axial rotation. That was actually a novel discovery uh, at that time, like in 2017. And apart from the intracellular gate, a uh, even more interesting discovery is the site of the channel of the uh, pore domain is also gated. You can see it can be like completely closed or there's a hole over there. And this is also important because it was predicted that such hole known as fenestration represents the acceptor site for many drugs. And now we actually have more data to show indeed some of them represent important sites for uh, 
potential painkillers. So detailed structure of the conformational change of the poor domain also reveal why some drugs uh, have a like a fast uh, uh, a mode of action while some have a slower one because they need to enter the central uh, cavity. So the most exciting discovery actually came from um, uh, uh, came for the mechanism of fast inactivation. So just now I told you that a ball and chain model was proposed to account for the fast inactivation of sodium channel. But then um, a ball and chain model would be like this. So a segment of peptide over there would block the intracellular gate directly as shown there. But this structure was published in 2020, way after ours. By that time, we already knew that this was not the mechanism for sodium channel inactivation. It's like this. In 2017 and even earlier uh, 16, when we solved the structures of uh, calcium and sodium channel, we found that the predicted IFM motif here uh, is far away from the intracellular gate. We could not imagine how it swings to block uh, the central gate. Then when we solved one more structure from electric eel, to our surprise, indeed, this IFM motif shown as orange uh, spheres undergo a dramatic conformational change to insert into the pore domain. But this is still, still not the ball and the chain model. Why? Because according uh, to the ball and chain model, IFM motif should insert into the central gate. However, here, it's, uh, insert for, it actually wedges into a cavity outside the gate. This reminded us of the so-called door wedge stopper, right? So to block the flow of ion, either you just stand um, in the center of the gate to block it, or you close the door by squeezing. So this is what the, this motif, IFM motif does. It actually inside, inserts outside the, the gate to squeeze it, to, to, to rotate and close. So this way we can effectively avoid ion leakage. I see some of you are sleepy. Probably should go faster to go to the interesting part. <laughs> yeah, I know that's too specific. I'm sorry. I mean, uh, I should pre probably have prepared a more general uh, introduction. Anyhow, uh, like for the, uh, you know, I, I, okay. So basically, the structure, uh, we were very excited because that really showcased the power of structure biology. That model was not predicted by anyone, not even by us. We just observe it. So next, we began to, with the structures available, it's easy to throw in different toxins and the drugs to understand their interaction. So I will not go into details because we have dozens of structures already. Just to give you several example, on the sodium channels were classified based on one toxin known as the tetrolo toxin, which was isolated from puffer fish. Very delicious puffer fish. <laughs> it's like some channels were known as uh, uh, TTX, sensitive, meaning that nanomolar concentration of TTX can effectively block this, uh, uh, this channel, these channels. And three of them colored in magenta or purple are known as TTX resistant, meaning that only uh, a application of micromolar uh, concentration can block them. So what makes the difference? After we solve the structure 2.6 enzyme structure of uh, nav pass in complex with TTX, we, we saw immediately what to make difference. It is actually here, just this tyrosine. Um, in the TTX resistance subtype, this tyrosine is replaced by cysteine here, cysteine or serine, which has very small set of chain. They lose the sort of cation and the pi interaction. So the structure is so powerful just from one image. Uh, you can immediately tell what makes the difference, okay? And also the same apply to another classic toxin known as STX. So, but why this one is important? Because from, from the structure, we can immediately tell that NAV 1.7, which is the target of our study, has a different residue in the STX coordinating site, okay? Why is this important? Because that means you can modify STX to make it specifically targeting or uh, target this as a leucine. You can introduce some hydrophobic group to make it like uh, uh, ha achieve higher affinity for, for NAV 1.7. So we were very excited when we uh, made this observation. However, after literature search, we found that some uh, chemists, computational uh, biologists already uh, designed 
this sort of derivatives and uh, applied for, for patent uh, protection. So that means even without structure, some smart people, even without PI, uh, sorry, without AI, they can uh, achieve what you, you would do based on uh, experimental observations. Anyhow, this did provide a solid evidence for their further study. Apart from these small molecules, uh, we also examine how some peptides may block the channel. So is this is a little entertainment for you. Like you can find it from YouTube. It's called Penning Snail Stab and Swallow Face. This is a clip from the three minute movie, okay? You can see um, the poor snail actually stab this poor fish, but it does not kill uh, the fish by stabbing. Instead, it injects the venom into the fish to paralyze it, okay? Just paralyze it and swallow uh, this, this, this poor fish. Then how is the fish paralyzed? It's because of this peptide. This peptide contains 16 amino acids and on the uh, uh, bottom is the predicted structure of this peptide. Then here came the question, came the question for us at that time. So how can the bulky peptide block a very narrow selective filter, all right? So we solve the structure of this peptide in complex with uh, NAV1.2, which is a CNS uh, uh, channel subtype. And, and you know, the answer is truly gratifying. We see that coordination of this peptide by the surrounding loops actually leaves a positively charged uh, lysine right above the entrance to the selectivity filter. So what does that mean? It means it competes with the binding of the cations to the channel. So this is very elegant. And after we solved this structure, we noticed that um, a few years ago, McKinnon Group also published the structure of a potassium channel in complex with a peptide toxin from a spider. And although the structures of neither um, the channel and the toxin is similar, they share a similar principle. That is to coordination of the entire peptide body leaves a positive charge residue lysine uh, right above the entrance to the channel. So we call that like a quark model or uh, resembling a quark to a, to, a, to a bottle, right? So this just, so this is even more exciting when you'll see some common principle that can apply to different classes of proteins and toxins. Okay, but again, here came the question. Uh, we have solved more than a dozen of structures for different sodium channels, uh, some from humans, some from insects, some from electric eel, but they all share very similar conformations, ex except for NAVPAS, the one from uh, insect. Um, and like, if we want to identify subtype space specific site for NAV 1.7, we have to look for the most variable regions, right? Then turns out um, the extracellular sites, uh, extracellular loops are most um, different, like colored dark green here. And indeed, when we uh, analyze the residues that specifically target just now the peptide toxin, we, we, well, the structure immediately explain why the toxin uh, can block NAV1.2 and NAV1.7 very effectively, but not 1.5 and 1.8. Why? Because you can see the residues that color that are colored blue represent the conserved residues, whereas those colored uh, black or even the, the, the dash represent the varied site. And 1.8 only has three residues remain there, right? That means they have already altered the site. So this also gave us a hint that the extracellular loop region may be targeted for developing uh, subtype specific peptides or biologics. So that's also the information derived from, from uh, uh, the structural study. And, but then <laughs> here, I mean, to address this fundamental question, the working cycle of sodium channel or the molecular basis for the electromechanical coupling, we need to solve the structure of more conformation, right? For this, we have tried like, you know, different toxins. Uh, and we have examined like the, uh, we, we, we check the database or we try to predict the model uh, using alpha fold two from time to time, but none of them give us like more information. But why it's so difficult to capture 
a different conformation because we uh, we analyze that if we we give three different states to the channel, resting state, activated state, and inactivated state. The resting state requires the energy input from this transmembrane electric field that represents a huge uh, energy level. If you think about it, like seven millivolts across only three to five nanometers. Um, so when we solve the, when we purify the protein from the environment, there's no such electric field. That's why the protein just relaxed to the inactive state. And on the other hand, for the active state, that's only transient, right? A open and immediate close. So that is determined by the kind of intrinsic chemical property of the channel. So to, uh, to, to capture the channel in a different state, we also need to give it some energy input or uh, to have some uh, regions to lock it in certain states. For that, we introduce mutations and we apply different modulators, but none of them give us like a cool different conformations. So we were, we, we, we were thinking, why don't we just generate a mini cell that has this membrane potential? What is that? Either we can use liposome, that's lipid vesicles, and there are already methods to manipulate the ion distribution across the membrane of liposomes. Alternatively, we can also directly apply electric field during sample preparation. So the second strategy, we, we were collaborating uh, with uh, some engineers and also uh, faculty members in the engineering school. Unfortunately, that didn't work. So we focused on uh, the first strategy, that is to engineer a cell mini cell, very small. That, that is a tremendously simplified uh, system. So to put the liposome into the eyes, it's not that easy. It's not, it was not as easy as we have imagined. To cut the long story short, uh, Dr. Xia Yao in my lab, a postdoc back then, um, found that it's not easy to have like a sufficient number of liposomes into the so-called vitreous eyes. So that's also easy to understand, uh, but I will not go into detail. So basically we realized that uh, the, the trick was to use graphene grid. That means uh, you have to put a thin layer of graphene on top of some uh, supporting uh, regions known as grids, okay? But the commercial graphene grids were expensive. But you know, the worst part is their quality uh, was very poor. Uh, it was either contaminated or broken. And then here showcase the power of interdisciplinary collaboration. So my first postdoc in Princeton University was actually from uh, material science, Dr. Imo Han, uh, who got her PhD from uh, Professor Muller's lab in Cornell University, a uh, famous scientist, uh, material scientist. So her entire PhD thesis was to study um, the 2D nanomaterials. She actually was selected as uh, the 35, under 35, right, by the MIT review report this year. She is now a faculty member of Rice University. So although we think like, oh, it's so difficult to obtain high quality graphene grids, but for her, this was like a piece of cake. Uh, so she just came up with a protocol um, in two months that gave us high quality and uh, uh, inexpensive and highly reproducible graphene grids. With that, we were able to achieve, very, I mean, we were able to, get very good samples. For example, here for very small protein, we can easily obtain a data set that uh, reached the resolution of 2.6 and then 2.2 angstrom. And with the, this kind of graphene grids, the liposome, the small vesicles can enter uh, the vitreous eyes easily. And then uh, Dr. Xiao Fan also uh, worked out a uh, very good protocol that uh, known, that's known as the deep PD classification for data processing of proteins embedded in the liposome. So here, each step represent, represents some uh, like novel attempt. And with you know, their collective efforts, we were able to solve uh, the structure of the membrane protein embedded in, in the liposome. To our knowledge, this was the first high resolution uh, cryo-EM structure of membrane protein embedded in the liposome. And as you can see here, apart from uh, the protein, we were also able to visualize the membrane, which has different curvatures. And when we saw this, we predicted that this system can be used to study the interaction between a mechanical sensing channel and the liposome. And indeed, a couple of years later, uh, my former, at that time, my former co colleague, but now my colleague, Bai Long Xiao uh, in Tsinghua University, were able to 
uh, was able to solve the structural mechanical sensing channel, which by the way is also Nobel winning uh, channel uh, two years ago by Adam, uh, I forgot his last name anyway. And they were able to capture a totally different conformation using this system. So this shows, uh, this also showcases the power of the new system. Although this is kind of uh, relatively easy for us uh, with the you know, combined effort from a material scientist and computational uh, biologist. Uh, for, for them, this is a quantum leap. All right, and now I see the time is up. So uh, to summarize, like, you know, everyone's talking about AI, but I want to tell you, what I want to tell you is you have to be careful when you use AI to predict your structure for uh, uh, advanced study. So first, uh, the AI cannot predict novel conformations because it uh, relies on the existing knowledge. At least now it cannot. And second, for the interaction between drugs and the protein, uh, AI is simply incapable of as, as of now. And third, even for the structure prediction, it, sh it says like alpha fold, that means it's only like the, uh, like the rough folding of the protein. But when it comes to the side chain, um, you have to be very powerful. Um, someone already published that the predicted structure, structure may contain error, so you have to be careful. And also, you know, for our future study, so the title is about targeting sodium channels uh, for pain relief. However, you have to keep in mind uh, our body, any organism is a very complex system, right? So we need to understand not only this uh, protein per se, we need to understand their, in, their uh, surroundings and to understand the dialogue, the crosstalk between the protein and its neighbors. So, and also we need to capture different conformations to identify novel binding sites like, like a hand in this conformation can hold something, but not this conformation, not this conformation. It's the same to the protein. You have to capture more conformations to identify novel uh, drug sites, but none of this uh, can be aided by AI as of today. Okay, uh, with that, this is like the field direction, um, either in situ structural analysis or uh, some detailed high resolution dynamic analysis of the uh, target macromolecules. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my very capable uh, team in the past 15 years. I will not uh, list all of them, but I mean, even uh, more gratifying than publishing a paper is to see uh, the maturation of your advisees, right? Those who are, whose name are colored uh, orange are now uh, PIs. Um, in, well, all of them are you know. Oh, so those, those who are trained in Tsinghua were actually uh, an RPS in Westlake University, but um, the, you know I have several trainees from Princeton University. They joined either Rice University, Wuhan University, or uh, USCC. I hope they all thrive there. And finally, uh, please allow me <laughs> for introduction. I mean, just like a very brief advertisement for Shenzhen Medical Academy Research and Translation. Simply put, it is a combination of local NIH and HHMI. So we are uh, a funding body that support extramural research with the funds generously provided by Shenzhen government. So uh, this year, we already started the proposal collection, but it can only allow uh, like the organizations in Shenzhen to apply for that. But those who are in Hong Kong are welcome to establish collaboration with investigators in Shenzhen so that you can also apply for the grant as advisor, uh, as collaborators. In the future, we will expand this program uh, to the greater Bay Area. And also we have uh, like slots for 398 PIs. Why? Because our original goal is 400 PIs. And just as of last week, we had two uh, outstanding young scholars uh, that took our offers. So thank you again, Professor Chen, and I'm sorry for uh, running over time. Probably thank you. Thank you, Professor Yang, for such a uh, wonderful presentation. Professor Yan, please kindly remain at the side stage because after your wonderful and inspiring presentation, definitely I think our online uh, and also on-site audience would have some questions to Professor Yan. And now it's time for the Q&A section. And for on-site participants, if you have any questions later on, don't worry, simply just raise your hand and our conference helpers will pass the microphone to you. And for our online participants, you can share your questions in the Q&A box inside the Zoom. And the Q&A section will be moderated by Professor Chen 
uh, Ting Yan, Director of the Poly U Academy for Interdisciplinary Research. And without further ado, I guess we will now pass the stage to Professor Yan and Professor Chan for this Q&A section. Professor Chan, please. All right, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Yan, for your wonderful talk. Let's uh, give uh, another round of applause. You know, uh, Professor Tan said uh, he's a structure engineer can answer the questions. And for me, it's a building engineer and I really feel, you know, I'm just uh, in somewhere in a crowd. I see, uh, <laughs> I don't understand much about it. But one thing I definitely learned, you know, when in the past when I see something, you know, painful, I always think it's a bad thing. But today Professor Ian told me, you know, when you feel pain, actually it's a good thing. Otherwise, you might die, right? <laughs> but on the other hand, and it's, uh, I think it's also uh, she give us a very positive message. You know, when you could work very deep, like a Professor Yang is wonderful. And if you couldn't, like me, then probably wanted to work a little bit broad area by collaborating with the Professor Yang. Maybe next time I could work with you for another nature paper. That's always my dream, all right? If we can build the electric box that can give <laughs> the stimuli to the sample during uh, blunt freezing. Okay, all right. Uh, now I think uh, we have a lot of questions um, online uh, already, but I'd like uh, first to give uh, the people here uh, in this room the first chance. Yes, please. Uh, please just uh, uh, help us to give the microphone, then everyone just state your name, Affiliation, and then um, yeah. Uh, thanks very much for your uh, great uh, speaker presentation. <laughs> uh, uh, because uh, I'm uh, I'm a PhD student, uh, major in materials science, uh, but I studied uh, biochemistry, uh, etc. Uh, in my high school, and I follow your information for about nine years and eight years <laughs> um so so uh, uh i'm not a uh, an research student in uh biological uh structural biology so i want to uh um i i like to <laughs> It's all right, it's all right. So, so, so. so it's my dream come true for eight years. And, uh, and uh, would you like to recommend some basic um, um, biolo uh, biological books or et cetera from, for us? Oh, so you are in material science, right? Yeah. So if you want to start, uh, serious research in, in, in life sciences, I would recommend like the textbooks. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because there are, very, there are several uh, classic textbooks, textbooks like in biochemistry, I prefer, I, my favorite is uh, Leninger's principle in biochemistry. And for like uh, genetics, like the gene, I, I even don't know which, I use like a gene five, and then probably that means the fifth edition of gene. So the book is, the title is gene, okay, the book name. Uh, or yeah. like probably now it's gene four, uh, nine or something. I haven't followed that. And also cell biology. There are, uh, there are like, you know, several very classic textbooks in each area. And personally, I also prefer a book uh, called uh, The Eighth Day of Creation. So that is a very fun book to read. It's about the history of molecular genetics that happened, that uh, occurred in 1950s in Cavendish laboratory. It's about the discovery of double helix, the discovery of uh, like codons. So I, I really uh, enjoy reading that book. Okay, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Professor Yang, thank you for the interesting talk. I'm a professor at Lucy University. Uh, maybe we go to some academic maybe. So yeah, for the, and uh, drug development you are talking about. So any candidate can be developed to target the aerostatical side you mentioned. Okay. 
it's fine. Yeah, just the first question is about the drug development. I think you are talking about the binding site, but you also mentioned you discovered some aerostatical site, right? Can we develop some drug to target the aerostatical site? Yeah, that's the first question. Allosteric or extracellular? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you're talking about you discover some aer aerostatical site. Right? I use extracellular, so let me explain. So for the memory protein, mm -hmm. we divide uh, the structure into three parts based on yeah. their uh, uh, localization, mm -hmm. extracellular means outside the cell. Membrane, transmembrane means like the uh, part embedded or intracellular. So while we're talking about the extracellular side, and yes, indeed, there are many drugs that uh, have their uh, action on the channel through allosteric yeah, side. Yeah. I, didn't, I didn't talk about it today, oh, okay. but I published uh, one paper in PNAS recently about uh, like a drug side. So it turns out, you know, before, before any structure was available, there were like uh, hundreds of studies, um, you know, using mutagenesis to identify the drug binding site. Mm -hmm. And from our structure, amazingly, the mutations, the, the site predicted by the mutations was actually not the direct binding site. Then we realized, because for this channel, if you think about it, uh, the drug has to get access to, to, to the binding site, right? But this channel is under motion. So you have, to, I mean, uh, the channel has to generate this hole for uh, the drug to get through. So residues that affect either the motion or the exit or, I mean, the entrance or exit path may also eliminate, uh, like weaken the drug binding. That's why from the mutagenesis, we now realize some of the side predicted were completely wrong. So we call that allosteric side, meaning that uh, this, uh, previous uh, identified, uh, it's actually not site. It's just like residues are not the direct binding site, but they do have an effect because when you mutate that residue, there is a very obvious effect on drug binding, on the mm -hmm. efficacy of the drug. So we call those sites uh, allosteric site. Okay, okay, thank you. All right, thank you. I think, uh, yeah, before we ask for another questions here, I uh, like to give the people uh, in the Zoom the chance. That's a question about uh, your work. It seems uh, very useful for the disease treatment. So do you think there's uh, any practical application for drug development or something like that? We should, um, you could really help people. I think so, uh, because as I mentioned, uh, originally we were targeting that 1.7 for drug discovery, but uh, recently like that 1.8 also became a, a kind of a, a popular target, right? Uh, so our work can reveal as the question, uh, like the allosteric site versus the ortho, uh, what's that, uh, orthosteric, right? That's the word, because I, I try to memorize like the English name for this kind of words, which I didn't learn from college, uh, poor memory now. So, um, so on one hand, this can give you a hint. On the other hand, there are already a lot of lead compounds that can target these channels. So we already solved uh, a large number of such structures. I'm sorry, I didn't show any of them because it's not published. Mm -hmm. So this can uh, show the very specific interaction between these lead compounds and, and the channel. So we can offer some advanced insight on how to modify okay. these compounds. All right, thank you. Now we have a question over there. Yes. Okay, uh, please pass the microphone. I just hope the question can be a little bit brief because uh, otherwise we don't have a time for reception. Okay, I think you just say, uh, oh. Actually, it's my second time to listen to your talk. And the last time- Just one second because we need it. So I wanna- uh, So I wanna ask you, from what we could, we, what we could just derive the knowledge from our traditional medicine. Yeah. So from traditional what? Or Chinese, uh, traditional Chinese medicine. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, among the structures we solved, some of the, so we haven't started this, but 
some of our uh, so-called lead compounds are actually, actually not lead compounds, but they are chemicals isolated from plant, like a natural product, right? So we also, when I, so I only started this, when I came back, I uh, reached out to uh, colleagues in, 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 in Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences, and some of them study traditional Chinese medicine. So one, uh, I don't know whether I should say this, one, one strategy we're using is we throw the extracts of some uh, traditional pain killers. I won't, I won't name that, right? Because this is not an advertisement. Uh, so, and then, you know, because we do not know what exactly is the ingredient that has this effect, uh, like for pain relief. So we just mix that with our channel and we did see some extra density, but then the challenge is what that is from a mixture. So that's some research ongoing. Okay, let's uh, also one related question so from the internet. You know, let's a lot of implications um, uh, also in the um, in studying the mechanisms of uh, non-drug treatment, like uh, when you use uh, the Chinese muscle art or something like that. Do you uh, do you think this will be uh, of the interest to you? Uh, it's not from my own study, but. Um... So I'm not sure whether you are aware of the work by Professor Qiu Fu Ma, uh, who applied acupuncture to mice and then recorded the immune and the neural response, okay, by imaging and electrophysiology. And with that approach, they can uh, define the so-called xue wei on the mice. And that, uh, he's, a, he's an expert. He returned to uh, Westlake University from Harvard. He, mm -hmm. he was full professor in Harvard. So I think that study is very interesting. So it's not related by my own research, but I happen to know him. Okay. Yeah, that, uh, there's also uh, one question about the use of AI, right? You, you mentioned that like AI is a little bit disappointing. But the question yeah, here- I, I keep using as of now, right? Okay. <laughs> because I were, I'm, to be honest, I'm also scared by AI because of its rapid uh, like uh, kind of maturation. So are you afraid of losing job because AI may do your work? <laughs> Interesting. So this afternoon when I was talking with Professor Zhang, uh, uh, speaking with Professor Zhang, I was like, as long as the AI cannot answer two questions. Mm. First, what's the, ori the origin of universe and the origin of life? As long as AI cannot answer that, I don't think any scientist would lose hope, right? Because that's the ultimate question for us. <laughs> we will keep our job. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'd like to give another chance for questions in this audience. Yes, please, and that lady over there. No, no, I think I better use the microphone. Uh, thank you, Professor Yan. And I have a question about the, you mentioned at the very first research question about the selectivity of the ion channels. In my uh, study of the, I don't remember, is the molecular biology or physiology, we learned about uh, the ions came in or out from out to the cell in pairs, such as uh, we have one sodium ion in and we have a potassium, uh, we have a potassium ion out. So when the, when you learn about the uh, selectivity of ion channels, could you please explain a little bit about the uh, selectivity on the interest, intracellular side and the extracellular side? Interesting. So when you talk about the sodium and potassium in pair, you are actually talking about the sodium potassium pump. Mm -hmm. All right. So in I mean, if you think about our extracellular milieu or the environment of the cell, we have a high concentration of uh, sodium. In the in our blood, right, and a low concentration in the cytosol, and for potassium, it's the opposite. So the extracellular concentration of sodium is 150 millimolar, and uh, like about 10, about 15 millimolar inside. And for potassium, it's the opposite, 140 to 150 millimolar inside, and 10 to 12 millimolar outside. So it's the difference that generates uh, this kind of electric field across the membrane. But if you think about it, in our like in our uh, neurons and the muscles, actually the sodium potassium pump consume more than 80% of ATP to mm -hmm. pump potassium to the outside, oh, sorry, sodium to the outside and potassium to the inside against their gradient. All right, so it is actually at the cost of uh, 
precious ATP that this transmembrane electric field is maintaining. So that is to address your first sentence, like the they move in pairs, but we're talking about different proteins. They are pumped. They are active transporters. And here I'm talking about sodium channel. So the channel, once it opens, there's no gate. So the ion just flow down its electrochemical gradient, or there's an electrochemical gradient. So it doesn't matter whether it's from outside or from inside, as long as it is, um, you know, down the gradient, it can go through. But it's not like all ions can go through. Only specific ions can go through specific namesake channels, like sodium going to sodium channel, potassium to potassium channel. Doesn't matter from which direction. Thank you. OK. okay. Um, you know, as a moderator, I find it's difficult for me even to read out a lot of vocabulary. So I'm going to take an easier job. There's someone asking you. You received a bachelor's degree from Tsinghua and then PhD from Princeton. You returned back to China to teach at the Tsinghua and then you went back to Princeton. Now you are back as the founding president of SMART. Now, uh, the two questions here. You know, what drives your decision to return to uh, Shenzhen? The second one, yeah, do you have any advice to young scientists uh, in China to, who might consider to pursue opportunity in the West? Because you have been so successful in the West uh, being a member of the US National Academy of Science, please. Thank you. I mean, thank you for giving me the opportunity to continue <laughs> with my last slide. So. Uh, I was attracted to Shenzhen because I have I have I have my faith in the Greater Bay Area, Great Bay Area. I still remember, like probably it was in 2019 when I was in the United States. I read the news about the Great Bay Area. Somehow I felt like at that moment I was like, oh, I have the sense I will end up there. Why? Because like my dream was to become a professor in Tsinghua University when I graduated from from Princeton. Okay, when I left Princeton. Sorry, when I graduated from Tsinghua head, and heading, uh, heading for US, my dream was to become a Tsinghua professor. And then when I left Princeton uh, in 2007, my dream was to become a professor <laughs> with Princeton. But this dream came true at least 10 years earlier. I mean, honestly, being 15 years earlier than I had dreamed for. Because if I became a professor of, uh, uh, like of Princeton at age of 55, I could probably have ended up there, right? But if I move there at age of 40, somehow I believe that you should move frequently to, <laughs> to refresh your study, all right? To keep you always like challenged and think something different. That's why I said, oh, maybe I will move back to China at age of 50. So when I moved there, I already know that I will not spend my entire life there. But then why didn't I go to any other place? Uh, because I, as I said, I mean, I feel like the Great Bay Area, I mean, it's kind of economically very uh, advanced and active. But honestly speaking, when it comes to research, to science and technology, excuse me, spare me, but I think Hong Kong used to be very uh, advanced, but now compared to Beijing and uh, Shanghai, at least in Shenzhen, we lack this sort of critical mass, right? So I feel Shenzhen is where the future <laughs> But exist. That's why I mean, I always follow, uh, you know, the sound from a deep heart. I feel that that's where I can contribute. That I mean, for to do the same thing. Um, if I remain in the United States or Tsinghua, I feel my contribution will be just limited with the same effort. But in Shenzhen, because we did not have this critical mass, for example, if I recruit a senior professor from the United States to SMART, that's something they can make a huge difference. But if I do the same to Tsinghua, oh, that's another professor, right? <laughs> I just feel you know, this is more rewarding. And my advice to the uh, young PIs would be dream big and aim high. When I started with sodium channels, to be honest, at that time, it was almost like a mission impossible because I always work on the very challenging problem. And maybe I was lucky. And we worked out most of our goals, except like the entire working cycle of sodium channels. So dream big and, and aim high. And um, I think research itself is very, uh, to be a scientist, it's already a privilege, right? Because you can always uh, discover something as the first one on earth, right? So I think this feeling just makes me, again, I would say privileged. That, that makes me feel, okay, I have a worthy life. 
anyhow, that that's my own feeling. So I think like for, yeah, I mean, housing salary, they are important, but not that important. Well, dream high, this, you know, you can accomplish that easily. Okay, well. No, thank you so much, Professor Yen. Uh, there, uh, there are still tons of uh, questions on the internet. I don't think uh, we have enough time to answer that. Maybe the last question from you, that's it. Okay, sorry. Thank you, Professor Yen. Um, I'm an assistant professor at the PolyU. This is actually my second time attending your seminar, so I'm feeling very privileged. Um, um, just a follow-up question. Um, as a young PI, uh, you know, like uh, we do this job because we really have passion for our research, and I can also see your passion for research. Um, so like when I'm, um, and also I can see you're a very successful uh, supervisor for your students and your postdocs because they got very good jobs in the future. And also I do care about my students' future. So sometimes um, I'm like um, telling my students about some research questions I'm really excited about, but maybe this can be quite challenging for them, which makes them a kind of highly stressful. <laughs> and also sometimes they may feel frustrated when they don't get the expected results I, I hope to get. <laughs> so um, do you have any suggestions for the young PIs? I, like how to dream big, but also be realistic at your current stage. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful question. Probably only have one minute, basically to balance your projects. So uh, I also care um, my students, right? I want to make sure they always have confidence. So you do not want to give them your lifetime project. So you have to give them some projects um, that can be, we use the word feasible, that can be accomplished within like one or two years as a training, technical training. So. When my students join my lab, I always give them a relatively easier project just you know, for technical training. And during this process, they can get this sort of positive feedback. They gain uh, confidence. They begin like, to be more and more in, in, uh, uh, enjoy research. That's my advice. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, well, thank you, Professor Yang, for your very inspiring uh, talk. And, uh, you know, as many of us here, we often just see you in TV. And today you really stood in the stage and then uh, set a very good example for us, especially the young uh, scholars here. Uh, let's give uh, Professor Yang another applause, uh, another round of applause. Thank you.